I'm Chris Sims. And I'm Franco Terrazano. This is the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. We're dedicated to lower taxes, less waste, and more accountable government. In this episode, we're going to take a deep dive into the federal government's budget update to see just how big of a financial mess Ottawa is in. And in Waste Watch, we'll tell you about how a government agency spent a truckload of money on social media photo shoots that were really lame. But first, there's big news in the ongoing ethics investigation into the relationship between Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the We Charity Group. We know the Trudeau government awarded the WE charity with about a $900 million sole source contract to administer a student summer jobs program. Both parties, however, quickly agreed to scrap the deal after some controversy and pushback from the media and Canadians. Originally, Trudeau said it had to be a sole source contract because the WE charity was the only group who could possibly manage this money. Here's what he said on July 6th. Uh, the WE charities are evaluated by our public service as being uh, the best and only uh, organization able to deliver on the scale that we need. Well, that's a crazy statement, uh, especially given that the government is now going to do it in-house. Exactly. And when you think about it, there are 37 cabinet ministers and 39 parliamentary secretaries, plus all their staff, plus all their bureaucrats. And yet they still say they needed to soul source this out. It doesn't make any sense. But here's the kicker. We Charity has really close ties with the Trudeau family. And that raises some accountability questions. When it was asked about those ties, here's what the We Charity said on June 25th. Quote, the charity has never paid an honorarium to these individuals for their involvement in these programs and events. End quote. Well, turns out Trudeau family members did get paid for working for We. In fact, they got paid a lot. The online news site, Canada Land, had the story. It included all the receipts showing the Trudeau family payments. Then the Prime Minister's office got wind of it, so they rushed the info out through the CBC to get the story out there in the media cycle. Turns out, Margaret Trudeau, the mother of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, she's been paid more than $250,000 for 28 speeches. The Prime Minister's younger brother, Alexandre Trudeau, also known as Sasha, he was paid about $32,000 for eight speeches. They were paid this money in speaking fees through the WE charity. Trudeau's wife, Sophie Grégoire Trudeau, she's actually an official ambassador for the WE charity, and she hosts a podcast for this WE group. Even she was paid about $1,500 to speak. Now, Trudeau himself has spoken at lots of WE events, and there's even a really fancy promotional video about Justin Trudeau made by this WE group, although there's nothing showing that he got paid. Remember, this is the same charity that was supposed to administer nearly $1 billion in taxpayers' money. A key issue here is that there wasn't a competitive bidding process to handle this project. The government didn't allow other organizations to compete to be able to deliver, the taxpayer-funded program. Instead, Trudeau's cabinet rubber-stamped the decision to award the contract to We Charity. And all this happened while Parliament wasn't sitting, so opposition parties couldn't fully question this deal. Well, this is what the Prime Minister's office had to say about the incident, and I quote, What is important to remember here is that this is about a charity supporting students. And so the Prime Minister's office is saying, well, you have to remember it's about the kids. <laughs> well, here's what the opposition MPs had to say. You would have thought there was an adult in the room with the prime minister saying, hey, Justin, you cannot give a billion dollars to people that your family work for. Parliament needs to be recalled. Parliament was shut down so that the prime minister could hide from accountability. Um, but now he has once again been caught and, and he needs to answer for that. Waiting a month for the government to, to run out the clock before they produce documents on this is not sufficient. That was NDP MP Charlie Angus saying Trudeau should have known better and Conservative MP Michael Barrett calling for Parliament to sit again so they can take a closer look. And you know, this isn't Trudeau's first run-in with the Ethics Commissioner. It's not his first rodeo. This is the third ethics investigation into Trudeau since he first became Prime Minister about five years ago. The most recent case, of course, concerned former Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould, and that earlier one dealt with the fancy trip that he took to the Aga Khan's island. 
In both of these cases, Trudeau was found in breach of the Conflict of Interest Act. He broke the rules. Alarm bells should be ringing everywhere here. Exactly. And, you know, this really shows the importance of watchdogs like the Ethics Commissioner, whether it's liberal, conservative, or any other political party. It's important to have an Ethics Commissioner who holds politicians accountable. And it also shows the importance of watchdogs outside of government, like the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. You know, whenever politicians are dreaming new ways to waste tax dollars or are trying to hide from transparency, our supporters are right there to hold them accountable. And of course, we will stay on this story, and I'm sure we're going to have lots more to say on this mess soon because, you know, I think it's a safe bet that we haven't learned the last of it yet. And you can keep track of this ongoing saga at taxpayer.com. And we can do something about it right now. Uh, our listeners and supporters, why not give the Auditor General a call? Uh, she's brand new to the job. Her name is Karen Hogan. She just signed on to the Auditor General job in Ottawa last month. Send her an email, give her a nice phone call, and encourage her to crack open this case to take a very close examination of any relationships between the Trudeau government and this WE charity group. All of her contact info is in our show notes. Coming up next, Todd's going to take a deep dive into the federal government's economic update with our federal director, Aaron Woodrick. And just a warning, the debt numbers may be disturbing for some listeners. Stay with us. It's time for a deep dive. This is the part of the podcast where we get deeper into important issues. And this week we got a update from Federal Finance Minister Bill Morneau. He's calling it a fiscal snapshot to show us where we are in the fiscal plan for Canada. Or maybe he's not showing us much. Aaron Woodrick, our federal director, is here. And at very least, he can show us some pretty big numbers. Aaron, tell us about that. Well, Todd, I did something actually I've never done before. Uh, usually when I write a press release and I, I'm writing, you know, a big number like billion or trillion, I just write the, the word. Um, but uh, rather than write out the word trillion for our press release, because it's a relevant number I'm going to talk about, I'll read out to you what that number looks like when it's on paper. It's, it's one, zero, 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 zero. So that's a one with 12 zeros after it. Uh, it's a trillion dollars, and it's the number that our federal debt is going to hit sometime uh, in the next few months. You know, I have kids. You have kids. You probably hear them on the podcast from time to time. We try to get them to be quiet, but yeah, it doesn't always work. But our kids are going to be paying for this debt probably for their whole lives. Uh, a trillion dollars in debt. That's a really sobering thing. It really is. And, um, you know, we, we get that number from the ministers, what he's called a fiscal snapshot. It was basically an Instagram selfie, really. There was not a lot in it, in spite of the fact it was 168 pages. And for the first time uh, during this crisis, we got an official estimate of the size of the federal budget and the deficit. And it, it clocked in at a whopping $343 billion. Uh, and even worse, when you, you take all that uh, new borrowed money and add it to our existing borrowed money, uh, that's how we get to that uh, that really depressing $1 trillion figure. Man, when you get that many zeros behind a number, uh, it, that is, that's scary. I think most people's experience, though, with money, we're talking about 20s and 100s. Maybe we talk about thousands. Very few of us think in terms of millions and billions, and almost nobody's uh, even looked at a trillion. So Give us some sense of how much $343 billion is. Can you give us some kind of picture? Yeah, I, I, I know, uh, you know, doing this for a living, one of the big challenges uh, with really big numbers is it all just sounds like a lot of money. It all sounds the same. Um, but maybe I'll let uh, the opposition finance critic, conservative Pierre Polliver, give us a little bit of context. Of $343 billion. To put that into perspective, when this government took office, the entire budget of the Government of Canada was about $260 billion. In other words, they are borrowing more in one year than the Government of Canada used to spend it's in, in its entire budget not long ago. So you can see that it's a pretty big sum of money. 
Another way you could look at it is that back in February, before any of this madness hit, the deficit was actually on track to be just $30 billion. So now we're 11 times bigger than that, and it's only been four months. That's an astonishing amount of money. Now, you're talking about a number of terms. You've got deficit and debt. Uh, you mentioned the trillion dollar debt. That's a thousand billion dollars. Hard to even imagine. Um, but it's easy to get lost in this terminology, deficit and debt. So let's, let's just uh, go over that again. Tell us the difference. Sure. And, you know, it, it is uh, astonishing how often uh, politicians actually get them mixed up, which is pretty troubling when you think about it, since they're the ones in charge of all our tax money. But the deficit is just the difference between the money the government's taking in and the money it spends in a single year. So, for example, if a government takes in $10 billion in a year, but they spend $12 billion, then the deficit's $2 billion for that year. The debt, on the other hand, is just all those accumulated deficits put together. Uh, and unfortunately, in Canada, we run a lot of deficits. Uh, over the last 50 years in this country, on the federal level, there's only been 13 times out of those 50 where we have not run a deficit. So, uh, you know, Justin Trudeau has added a lot of money to the debt. Uh, to be fair, even Stephen Harper before him added more debt on than he paid off. Um, uh, you know, virtually every prime minister has done that. Um, but it's really just uh, carrying a balance forever on our government credit card. And as of April this year, that balance was $775 billion in debt. So that's how we get to that trillion dollar number. We've got $775 billion on the government credit card already. We're adding another $343 billion. That puts us right over the trillion dollar mark coming up pretty quick here. So Yeah, it's uh, actually a little bit more than a trillion. And I went back to check out uh, the CTF's Debt Clock. We have a dedicated website. You can check it out at debtclock.ca. And it shows the number of the federal debt ticking up. It's actually going up more than $10,000 a second right now, if you can believe it. And I went to check, uh, for interest's sake, how long it took the last time the debt increased by $343 billion. Yeah, I'm going to go on a limb here and suggest this comparison is probably going to be pretty depressing. But go ahead, man. Lay it on us. Well, it turns out that the last time uh, the debt rose by $343 billion, it actually took 28 years. And then here we are today, and the Trudeau government's managed to, add, managed to add the same amount in just four months. That's astonishing. That's just absolutely astonishing. But I think, of course, the, the context, it's an extraordinary time right now. And, of course, it's an emergency with the COVID situation. So how much blame should we be putting on the Liberal government and how much blame is going to COVID? How do you break that apart? Yeah, look, I don't think anybody blames the Trudeau government uh, for COVID. Um, you know, every government around the world was, was really caught off guard and had to spend a lot of money. But I think it's important to hold them to account regardless for two reasons. First of all, the position they had us in right when the crisis hit in the first place and secondly, and more recently, their failure to really lay out a plan about what they want to do uh, at this point going forward. Okay, so let's take a look back first. What kind of position did they put us in? Well, people might remember when uh, Justin Trudeau came into office in 2015, the economy was in pretty good shape, it was growing, the budget was balanced, and the Prime Minister had uh, said he was going to run some deficits, but they were going to be small and they were going to be temporary. Uh, in fact, let me play a clip here just to, to remind everybody about what he said. And what Canadians need are leaders who will tell them the truth. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. We are committed to balancing the budget in 2019. So that was the Prime Minister on the campaign trail in 2015. Of course, everybody uh, knows now he broke that promise in spectacular fashion and he ran deficits every single year, never came close to balancing. Now, if the Liberals had just kept the budget balance when they came into office in 2015, the debt would have actually been about $100 billion less than it is now. So basically, because of all the decisions they made well before COVID ever hit, uh, we're an extra $100 billion in debt. And that's really frustrating because on one hand, you can't predict the COVID is coming, but you know that tough times do come, whether it's COVID or something else. We had a number of years of good times and we were borrowing money in the good times. Now we're in the tough times and we've got even less money than we had before. That's a really tough situation that we've, uh, we've gotten ourselves into. 
Yeah, and you know, I think it's actually a pretty strong rebuke to the liberal approach um, before COVID, which was basically, you want to sum it up as, as don't worry, be happy. Um, they had this attitude that was very flippant, that that was nothing to worry about. Um, and I, I think uh, what's happened is actually a vindication for groups like the CTF, because we've long argued that you need to be prudent in the good times and save up to prepare for the bad times. It doesn't mean that we had, you know, we had a crystal ball and we predicted something exactly like COVID, but it does mean we think that it's better to generally play it safe and prepare yourself for, for unforeseeable events. Okay, I think the math is pretty clear. We racked up a ton of debt during the good times. That was a bad idea. It is what it is. Let's look forward. What's the plan going forward? What does this, the snapshot show us about where we're going and how we're going to climb out of this mess? Yeah, you would think that, uh, that a snapshot would include at least some hint about these sorts of things, but it really didn't tell us anything at all. Uh, they didn't have any clue in there to let us know how they were planning on winding down some of these extremely expensive uh, temporary spending programs. Um, you know, they didn't uh, say anything about CERB, for example, which really needs to be adjusted, and which penalizes people who are willing and able to get back to work. There was no hint at all about, uh, you know, ways to cut the cost of government. Um, so, you know, you've got Canadians who've lost their jobs, they've lost their businesses, they've taken pay cuts, and they're watching as, as government workers who are, or employees who are not working, um, keep getting their full paychecks. Um, and the government is not even looking at ways to reduce cost. And, and there was no plan at all to revive the economy. Uh, which of course the government put into an induced coma on purpose, uh, you know, to fight the health crisis. And every day we hear uh, news that more and more businesses are going uh, bankrupt. And yet, uh, you know, we just had no plan at all from the government. That's really weak. That's really frustrating. The government, I mean, it's had months. I, I understand it's a tough situation. It's changing fast, but coming out with no plan at all, that's pretty weak. Yeah, it was is really surprising in a way. I mean, the, the minister basically says, well, everything's too unpredictable, and so we can't make any plans. But the thing is, he's the finance minister. It's his job to make plans, um, you know, even if they're flexible plans or, or plans with, uh, you know, various scenarios. Uh, because the alternative is um, we're just sort of flying blind, and Canadians are left in the dark about, uh, you know, how the government plans to, to dig us out of this really big hole. Okay. So Finance Minister Bill Morneau didn't unveil a plan with his long-awaited fiscal snapshot. That's pretty unforgivable, but surely to goodness they're going to get it together pretty soon. When are we going to see a plan? Well, you know, that remains to be seen. Um, there's been no official announcement, but I am betting that they will have something in the fall that provides at least a little bit more detail. Um, and look, that's good. It's better late than never, but it was a real missed opportunity here. We're already four months in. This, this opportunity last week was the time to sort of at least lay out a plan and they didn't do it. And of course, the problem is the longer we wait for a strategy, uh, especially when it comes to winding down things like emergency spending, you know, the bigger the deficit's going to be and then the higher the climb is going to be out. So, uh, you know, there's no, there's no candy coating. And unfortunately, this time we're, we're going to face some pretty tough times over the next few years. And there's going to be some tough choices that have to be made. But you know what? That's what the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is here for to hold governments accountable, to push them to trim spending, to tell them to get on to this uh, kind of stuff. Everybody's working hard for their money right now, and politicians need to be careful how they're spending it. We're going to keep pounding them, try to make uh, some of those decisions a little better, or at least a little less bad, maybe. If you want to see how fast the debt is going up, if you want to get some visual representation of this, you're going to want to brace yourself, but go over to debtclock.ca. It shows the debt going up in real time. And I'll warn you, it's going up pretty fast. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, president of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Sorry for interrupting the podcast, but I wanted to take a few seconds of your time to tell you more about the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. We are 235,000 Canadians from coast to coast that are fed up. We are fed up with politicians taking too much out of our paychecks, often to waste it on a bunch of pet projects, corporate welfare, and pork barreling to buy votes. We organize campaigns to push back on these politicians. These campaigns often include petition drives, billboards, media stunts, and more. But most importantly, they ask our supporters to pitch in and take action. Alone, we're a voice in the wilderness. 
Together, we're an army to be reckoned with. You can join the fight and sign up at no cost at taxpayer.com. That website again is taxpayer.com. Okay, now back to the podcast. It's time for Waste Watch. This is the part of the show when we make fun of the dumb things government spend your money on. We got James Wood here. He's our investigative reporter. He digs through the stuff all day long, all day long. And he's dug up a pretty funny one today. James, tell us about that. So you can buy a two pound bag of oatmeal for about three bucks. So you think taking a picture of a bowl of oatmeal wouldn't be that expensive. Yeah, I don't know how you could spend more than, I don't know, three bucks. But I'm guessing you caught government spending, finding a way to spend an awful lot more money than that. Tell us about it. Well, that's the thing. Health Canada, uh, they spent just over 11 grand on pictures for their Instagram page. They wanted pictures of cucumbers and bananas and oatmeal for their Healthy Canadians Instagram account. You know, I'm not much of a cook, but I can make oatmeal. Like this, this I can do. And there's a camera on my phone. Uh, you know, and I've looked at the Instagram uh, accounts a little bit. I'm not on Instagram much, but it seems like a lot of people can take pictures of food. I don't know why they want to, but it doesn't seem hard. Like, am I missing something here? Like, what, what, what talent did they pay $11,000 for? Well, I, I went to photography school, and I know that taking a picture of a banana or oatmeal isn't exactly rocket science, but the feds managed to spend just over 11 grand on this. No one else in the press is talking about this, but we dug the set of records presented to the House of Commons. You know what? I just I fired up the Google machine. There are literally hundreds of oatmeal photos on the internet for free. It says right there, free stock images. Why in the world didn't the government just fire up, uh, fire up the interwebs there and grab some free photos or send a couple staffers out. Hey, interns, go, go do something useful. Take a picture of a cucumber. Why, how could they not find an easier way on this? That's, that's a good question. While they did use a few stock images on the account, you can, you can see those. Uh, Health Canada told us that they actually commissioned a photographer because they didn't have one on staff and they couldn't find some of the exact photos that they needed. They wanted the food to match the guidelines of the Canadian Food Guide, for one, and some other uh, strange guidelines there. It was a bit bizarre. Matching to the, the Canadian Food Guide, that's not rocket science. Like, maybe don't take a picture of a Slurpee. Like, that makes sense. But, like, really anything in the fruit section should be good. And listen, you don't have to have a dedicated photographer. We don't have a dedicated photographer on staff, but it's not hard to get a shot if you need it. What photos were they having trouble finding? Well, that was, that was one of the weirder ones. So the one obstacle they cited was they couldn't find a photo of an adult wearing a helmet while skating in Canada. That was just impossible to find. So they had to commission someone to take this picture. And you can actually see the photo. It's a guy skating in Ottawa uh, with a helmet on just outside City Hall, having a great time, big smile on his face. You know, if you were going to have a scavenger hunt and you said, you know what, you got to find a photo of a Canadian skating with a helmet on, that scavenger hunt would be over in like seven seconds. Just walk into your, the nearest Timmy's and say, hey, does anybody got a photo of somebody wearing a helmet and skating? And probably two thirds of the people there would be like, here, look at my phone. Here's my kid skating. How in the world could they have trouble finding that? And actually, you know what? Now I think about it a little bit more. The federal government spent more than $8 million to build a rink right on Parliament Hill. That was like a couple of years ago. You're telling me nobody in the federal government thought to, hey, I'm going to take, take a few shots of this, you know, just snap a few candid photos. Really? How in the world could you have trouble finding a photo of a Canadian skating with a helmet on? That sounds like the easiest challenge in the history of the world. <laughs> Well, they also, I mean, on top of that, they paid for a, a photo of someone having a pretty rough time on the toilet. You know, uh, that's, that's just kind of getting weird now, man. That, that's weird. It's, it's Health Canada, of course, reminding us, important to get enough fiber in our lives. Okay, you know what? We're, we're not going to go down that trail any further. That's, I think we're out of time for the podcast. I'm sorry. We're out of time. Listen, here's the bottom line, though. The government spent 
$11,000 of taxpayers' money on pictures of bananas and oatmeal and skaters with helmets. And well, like a guy um, doing his business, I guess. All of that, all of that is a super dumb use of taxpayers' money. We're thinking of, of like some fun pranks to play on the federal government on this. So stay tuned for that because there might be more. Check out taxpayer.com for links to this whole story and uh, stay tuned. We're, we're going to have some more fun with this. I think. Thanks for listening to the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. And thank you so much to James Wood for editing it. And please subscribe, like, share, and review our show. It really helps us get the word out to more people. And thanks again for listening. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, President of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. If you've got another minute, I'd like to ask you to think about the one person you know that would really enjoy listening to this podcast. Do us a favor and do them a favor and send them a quick note to let them know about it. At the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we believe there is power in numbers. That's why we've worked so hard to build an army of taxpayers who are ready to push back. And we did it because people like you shared our work with that one person that they knew would really appreciate taking part. Thanks for listening, and thanks for doing your part to make Canada a better place.